Paul, Paul, play it one more time.
Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> Woo! Blessed be the name of the Lord. There are seven last sayings that Jesus said on the cross before he gave up the ghost and died. He said, uh, Father, forgive them. He told the malefactors, one of them, today you will be with me in paradise. His second, his third statement was, woman, behold thy son. His fourth was, my God, my God, and I'm going to say it, why hast thou forsaken me? And the fifth, I thirst, and the sixth, it is finished. And the seventh into thy hands. I commit my spirit. Praise the Lord. And I want to talk about tonight the fourth and fifth sayings of Jesus. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me and I thirst? And I know that's a controversial scripture because of one man called Dr. George Lamza who translated that verse differently where he said, he believed it, said, my God, my God, for this cause was I spared. And uh, I do believe Jesus was spared. Amen. He was spared in the garden. He was spared from going uh, to death prematurely. God heard his supplication and his cry. But I have studied this over and over and over again. I have looked into Dr. Lambs' Bible, and I don't like it. I'm just going to tell you flat out, I don't like it. And there's so many things in there that he has changed that have removed the divinity of Jesus. If you have read that Bible, or you have looked into it, or you have researched it, you will find many scriptures uh, that, for example, where the Word of God says that uh, um, uh, from He is from, Jesus, the prophets of our Jesus, He is from everlasting. Uh, Dr. Lamsa translates that to say He is predicted from everlasting. Mm -hmm. Where the Word of God says that uh, He was, Jesus was the only begotten Son of God, he has translated that to say that he was the firstborn of God. And there are, there are many, i found so many things like that in his Bible. And Dr. Lanza, if you have ever read any of his writings, he did not believe that Jesus was the only way to God. He actually formed a society not long before he died, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years before he died, it was called the Christian, Christian Muslim Society because his vision, one of his visions in life was to unite religions because they all had a path to God. Oh, oh yeah. This is fact. And uh, I always felt uncomfortable about that translation and I didn't know why. And so for this season, I felt like I need to go in and look at this more closely and see what I can find and see what I, you can see the Word of God says because God's Word is going to back itself up. And if the Word itself does not back itself up, then something's wrong with your theology. So I've done that and I'm a little bit shaky here tonight because I know I'm probably walking on thin ice because I think many of us have believed, maybe even preached, I know I have, uh, for years that Jesus never said, my God, my God, for this, I mean, for um, uh, why have thou thou forsaken me? He was quoting Psalm 22, which Dr. Lanza also changed. Uh, in Psalm 22 and verse 1, King David began that psalm by saying, My God, my God, 
Why hast thou forsaken me? The, the half of the psalm is, is direct prophetic vision of Calvary. The bulls of Bashan, the dogs that are surrounding him, the Gentiles that had control over him. He was nailed in his hands and in his feet. And, and there were there's so many uh, direct prophetic pictures of what Jesus went through on Calvary. And yet we want to take the first verse and change it. Why do we want to do that? And uh, Dr. Lanza changed the first verse in his translation of the Bible to say, My God, my God, why have you made me live? Why have you made me live? Is the way he translated, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So, uh, don't get your feathers too ruffled. Uh, let me deliver my lesson. This is the way I see it. I'm not trying to get you to see anything. I am uh, bearing my own heart for you. And I'm, I'm doing this, like I say, kind of quivering because I don't want to mess up somebody's uh, theology that you've embraced and loved for too long. Uh, but if there's truth in what I'm saying, embrace it. If you don't see it, you don't feel it, then just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. I've embraced it, and I believe it, and that's why I'm sharing it. So, um, all due respect to the masters and the teachers who've thought otherwise. But uh, I'm going to go a little bit different route here with this. And let's start in the very beginning, because if you want to understand something, go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. So go to Genesis chapter 2. And uh, I'm going to go to a lot of scriptures tonight, so keep your Bibles handy. You notice this is going to be more of a Bible study than anything else. And uh, uh, sometimes it's good to slow down and just teach. And so I hope and pray that I get through this tonight and get to deliver to the end of what I'd like to share. On Sunday, uh, I'm going to teach you a lesson of lessons as far as I'm concerned. And I want to talk about the blood from Egypt to Zion. So powerful. The blood from Egypt to Zion. I cannot believe it. Oh, it's been so good. I was telling my wife before the service, I'd like to just skip into Sunday. And not do this lesson, but I'm going to do it. Okay, are you all with me? Yes. I'm in Genesis, I'm in chapter 2, and I'm in verse uh, 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely eat. Die. In Hebrew, surely die is moot, moot. It is the same word. Surely and die is the same word. It is both die. You will die, die. You will die a double death. The Lord promised them in the day that you disobey me and you go and you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that I have forbidden you not to eat of, you will die, die. You will die a physical death and you will die a spiritual death. There will be an external death and an internal death. And we know that is true because the day that they did sin, they didn't actually immediately die a physical death. But they did die a spiritual death. That spirit within them, that light and that breath and that glory, uh, 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 that candlestick fell over, the light went out, and they were darkened within. Praise God. And that death came into their, uh, their, bottle, in their bodies, and they began to get old and decay. Even though uh, Adam lived nine, 960 years, he still uh, eventually died which he would not have done had he obeyed God. Bless the Lord and gone and eaten of the tree of life. They would have gained uh, immortality from and by the tree of life. So uh, we need to put that in our minds from the very beginning that 
The curse that came upon man due to sin was a double curse. It was a die, die. It was a spiritual death and it was a physical death. You all got that? Yeah. All right. This is very important that you uh, uh, remember that. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 59. Now, uh, what is death? What is death? It is, it is a transformation, yeah. It's the soul and the spirit separating from the body. It's, it, it's physical death is when there's a separation of soul and spirit. You die. This body dies when the soul and spirit goes. But what is spiritual death? Physical death. This is the death of the mortal. What is spiritual death? Sin. Uh, well, death is the wages of sin is death. So, Death is an effect of sin. Sin came, and because of sin, came the curse. Because of sin, we had an effect put on us, which was death. Physical death, spiritual death. I'm going to repeat a lot of things tonight, like I'm talking to little children, because I, I, <laughs> you are, I, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm driving to a point. Praise God. There's the physical death by Brother, uh, um, I know your name. I know his name. <laughs> Brother Doug Olson said uh, the separation. When uh, uh, the spirit and the soul separate from the body, this is called death. Death is separation. So what is spiritual death? Thank you. Spiritual death is alienation or separation from the presence of God. Amen. Have we all got that now? Amen. So we got physical and we've got spiritual. Separation of spirit soul from body and spiritual death is the separation of the presence, the nighness of God, the alienation from the presence of God. That is spiritual death. Now think about it. Uh, and that's not my lesson that I just inserted right here, how the religious world is full of spiritual death. Alienation. Separation from the presence of God. The more of the presence of God that you have got walking and talking in you, as God said, I will walk in them. I will talk in them. They shall, I shall be their, their God, and they shall be my people. Hallelujah. The more of that presence, the more the Spirit is illuminated, is alive, and walking to its uh, fullness, and the fullness of its uh, calling and potential. Praise God. But spiritual death is separation from God, and the cause of spiritual death is sin. Look here in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2. Now I want to make it very clear here and now that God forsakes nobody. God does not forsake. He's not a forsaker. I'm with you always, he said. Praise God. Jesus told his disciples just just what, a day or so, or hours before his crucifixion. What shall I say? The Father save me from this hour? No, for this, I am come unto this hour. For my Father is with me. He was very aware that God was, the presence of his Father was with him because he was doing the will of his Father. Right? Okay. What was the will of his Father? I'm getting excited. I wish somebody would shout for me. Hallelujah! What's the Lord of my soul? Thank you, Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 59, and verse 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Hello? Amen. Neither his ear heavy, 
that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. There is only one thing that hides God's face, and that is sin. There is only one thing that brings a wall of divide and an alienation between your spirit and the spirit of God. And that is our sins and our iniquities. Is that clear? The closer you walk with Him and the more in obedience to His will that you live, praise God, the more these walls that alienate us from His presence fall down. And the closer God is magnet, magnetized, is that a word? Huh? No, no, magnetized, like He's drawn to you. That God is drawn to people that have a sincere heart of, of, of purity. Between you and your God, 
you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Okay, now, how many know that Romans chapter 6, verse 23, write down your notes, you probably know it by heart, it says the wages of sin is death. We have established that death is alienation. Spiritual death is alienation from the presence of God. Physical death is a separation of body, I mean, a body, soul, and spirit, and the body goes to the grave and goes to decay. Both are from the same cause. Both of the curses, both of the surely die, or the moot moot, or the die die, are both caused from the same thing sin. Right? Okay. Thank you, Lord. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. Oh, glory to God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. 1 Peter chapter 2, thank you, Lamb of God. In Ephesians 4 18, Paul talks about this alienation in such a way where he says, we are alienated from the life of God. God's life is His presence. It is His breath. It is His fire. We are alienated, uh, uh, separated. Why? Because of sin. We're sinners. And everybody say amen. amen. I'm a sinner. Yes. We're sinners. And, and when we have not reached the point of presence and intimacy with God and the presence of God that our heart yearns for and desires. That's probably the reason we're all here on a Good Friday night in the house of the Lord because we have a yearning. Amen. We have a thirst. There is a, there is a hunger in us Amen. for the presence of God. Amen. But we, we started on the journey towards the presence of God some of us donkeys years ago. For me, it was from your mother. Forty some years ago. Yeah, well, you, that's right. Fifty years ago. Fifty years ago, and I'm still not in the point at the point of contact yeah. and presence yeah. that I yearn for. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's not God's fault. No. There is still the curse of sin. There is still a, a sinner in this mortal body. There is a body of sin. I am, am still a sinner. And it is only because of sin. Now it's not that you're going out and going to the nightclubs and you know you're... Uh, what do people do? <laughs> Get drunk and drugs and sex and porn and commit adultery and am I doing okay? <laughs> you know, it's not it's not that you, you've got to do that. It's not that you know you we're so bad people. It's just that there is still indwelling sin in us that has not yet been touched, has not yet been taken care of, has not yet been purified.
that if she goes and lives in pleasures, she is dead while she still lives. You remember that scripture? Yes. Or you, you want to go there and read it? Yes. Let's go read it. Yes. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We'll, we'll go to 1 Peter just a little bit. I'm just bouncing around here tonight. Yes. Trying to get my message across. Yes. 1 Peter. I mean, Timothy. 1 Timothy. I'm still with Peter. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Okay? And verse 5 and 6, it says, Now she that is a widow, indeed, and desolate, trusteth in God, and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. In other words, living to the pleasures of self and sin. You can be alive. You can come to church. You can even think you have life. And you can clap and dance and roll and skip and shake and run and twirl and, and do everything you're big enough to do. But there is a death there. It is a spiritual death because it is an alienation from the presence of God. This is what's wrong with the church world. It is void of presence. There is a tabernacle in Gideon, but it's got no presence in it. There's a priesthood still ministering, but there's no ark in there. There is an oblation still being upheld, and the feasts still being held. Praise God. And the sacrifices and the worship and everything still going on. But no presence because God's people are living in the pleasures of self, which has alienated our spirits from God. Yes. Yes. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother David. <laughs> it's simple, basic, what we've always known. But yet we don't seem to know. Because we reach out for the presence of God, but we don't deal with sin. I don't expect there to be a big church and have a lot of people because I will, by God's mercy and His grace, step on the sin. Spiritual death. 
He had to have suffered alienation. Come on, God! From the man, I feel the power of God. The death of the body 
or the spiritual death of the alien nation from the presence of God. Which death do you think hurt him more? Of course, the spiritual death has far greater pain especially to one who has lived in that presence. Jesus lived in the presence of God. Thank you, Lord. He lived in the presence of God. He always talked about His Father. I don't do anything I don't see my Father do. I don't speak of it, don't hear my Father speak. Everywhere I go, I go because He goes. If He doesn't go, I don't go. I go up the mountain and talk to my Father. It's all my Father, my Father, my Father. Everything's my Father. His whole life is consumed with the presence of his father. If you've seen me, you've seen him. Hallelujah. It was all my father. Don't you find it remotely, uh, or doesn't it raise a question in your mind? Certainly it does mine, where he did not say, my father, my father. He said, my God, my God. Yes. There's only one other place that I know about. In the New Testament, where Jesus called his father, my God. And that's when he says, go tell my disciples that I go to my father and their father and my God and your God. Yeah, yeah. Every other time he talked, it was my father. Intimacy. Yeah. Closeness. Yes. Relationship. Oneness. Fellowship. Hallelujah. My father. But in that moment, that intimacy was gone. At that oh, moment, let me explain some more. I'm getting ahead of myself. I think a lot of um, Christians today have some kind of a um, romantic understanding of Calvary. Yes. They romanticize. The whole scene. Oh, it's just so beautiful. And so it wasn't beautiful. No. We hid, as it were, yes. our faces from him. We esteemed him despised and rejected. Because of what he was suffering when he was on that cross and prior to it. The ones on his side, I guarantee you, they hadn't gone through floggings and thorns on their head and beatings on their face and beards pulled out and lashes on their back and told to walk up that road carrying their own cross. They were probably taken out of the prison cell and nailed on the tray. But Jesus had all of that prior. You talk about the heart pumping the dehydration, praise God, the weakness, the absolute torment and torture. Stop romanticizing about Calvary. It was ugly. It was painful. Praise God, he went through an excruciating death. Why? Because he took my curse. He took my sin. He took my of the moot, moot, the surely die, the death, death, the physical, the spiritual. He took it upon himself. Thank you, Jesus. In the most horrific display of the Son of God yielding to his Father's will. Go with me. Jesus, I bless you. To Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah. Oh, Jesus, I bless your holy name. Isaiah chapter 53. So we see that his body was made an offering 
for sin. That's clear to all of us. We know it, and we even know this, that many times we don't put pieces together. In Isaiah 53, in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, not just the body. Amen. When thou shalt make his soul. See, in Ezekiel chapter 18, it says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Jesus' soul went to hell. His body went to the grave. But my point here is that it not only was his body an offering for sin, separated in death, but his soul was an offering for sin, had to also have had a separation had to also have had an alienation from the presence of the one who gives the soul life. Are you with me here? Yes. This changed so much for me when I look at Calvary and what he did for me. It's not that you didn't know it, you knew it. But it's like I knew it, but I didn't know it. So many pities started to drop, bing, 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 like, oh, Jesus. The most painful thing that he had to have gone through was, well, let's look at Corinthians, and I'll, I'll go back to that thought. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Are you enjoying this? Is it okay? Yes. Can I keep talking a little bit? Yes. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and, and verse 21. Just, just try to imagine this. We're, we're talking about holiness. Jesus was holiness personified. Nobody was as holy as he. Holiness was in his face, his eyes, his deeds, his hands, his walk, his speech. He was, he is the holiness of God. He is the revelation of God, the, the person of God reflected in his face to us. Holiness. Can you imagine holiness? Absolute holiness. Holiness, having the sins of the world, pow, dumped on you. I can't imagine. I don't, I don't know. I cannot even begin to fathom what that must have felt like in the, both the body and in the soul of Jesus. At that moment when he hung upon the cross, oh, look what it says here. First, second, Corinthians uh, 5, verse 21. For he has made, that's the Father, has made him to be sin for us. Yes. Let it sink in. Yeah. We read too quickly. For he has made him to be sin. For us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in Him. He who is holy, He who is faultless, He who had no God, He who had no blame, He who was spotless, He who was absolutely set apart unto His Father.
has sinned. Never sinned in his life. Tempted, but didn't sin. Suffered, but didn't sin. Was reviled, and reviled not again. Was persecuted, but hated not. That one. Thank you, Lord. That one, that Jesus was made sin without and within. He suffered the double death like all human life does without him. Hallelujah. Okay, moving forward. Can I go a little bit more? Go to Galatians. Oh, that's what I say. Thank you, Jesus. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Thank you, Lord. I love you. Jesus, I love you. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So, he took the curse of the double death. Outward, physical, inward, the soul and the spirit, the alienation, the separation of soul and spirit from body, the alienation of soul and spirit from the presence of God. So when did that happen? I know his soul went to hell, but it had to happen before that. Because it was put on him before that. Ha! It was put on him while he was alive. It was the curse that killed him. I don't know if I'm making sense. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. It could not, people say, oh, well, he, he suffered that when he, he, his soul, when his spirit went to his father, and his soul was separated and went down to, to hell. And no. Yes, but no. Yeah. It had to have happened before that. Amen. When did the father look down and see that curse laid upon son? I have to do this. This is the only way that the path can be made for redemption. This is the only way that I can bring creation back to myself. Is you, the spotless one, the holy one, have got to be made the curse. I've got to make you the sin. And we just read in Isaiah 55, it's the sin that causes the face, the pomnim, the presence of God to turn away. So why do we say he did not suffer that? Of course he suffered that. He suffered spiritual death in my place. Or else he didn't take my place. Thank you, Jesus. But he did it. So, moving forward, I'm going quickly now. Let's go to Matthew, to the famous verse in Matthew 27. Bless your heart, Sister Nelda. I just love the way you love the Word of God. It blesses my heart every time. Thank you, Lord. And all of you. You're just a great group to teach. Praise Jesus. I'm in Matthew. I'm in chapter 27. What did Jesus say? Now, I mentioned Psalm chapter 22 a few moments ago. There are many of the Psalms. Do you remember when Jesus, let me go back to that. Do you remember when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus? And not Jesus, Peter and Cleopas. They were on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus appeared after his resurrection and he came walking with them and said, Why do you, you already look so gloomy and you already all know the story. 
And then they say, well, you know, who are you? Where have you been these last days? Don't you know what has happened here in Jerusalem? How that, you know, our, our king. And they just spilled their guts. And Jesus looked at them and said, well, oh, oh, oh fools. And slow of heart to believe. And it, it says that Jesus expounded unto them all the things that are written in the law, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning himself. The Psalms is more of a prophetic book than you realize. And so many of the Psalms, and particularly of David, were prophetic of the Messiah and of his suffering and what he went through. So many of the things you read, it's like David went through, like David didn't go through that. David didn't go through his hands and feet being nailed. David didn't go through being uh, surrounded by the bulls of passion. Well, maybe he was in a, in a spiritual sense, possibly. But so many of these things he didn't go through. But under the, the, the spirit of prophecy, he was prophesying about the day that was coming when the Mashiach would be hanging on the tree. And he had some experience along those lines where he could write about that experience. And he started that chapter by saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, I, I question that. And it's like, God help me. Help me to understand what that means. Well, what are you slow? What was being said? And why would Jesus get up there on the cross knowing full well? He said, I know where I come from. He said, and I know where I'm going. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew what his father's will was from eternity past. He had already laid it down and given his will. And he understood the will of his father. He was always trying to tell it to his disciples. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to rise again on the third day. He knew it all. He knew all the prophetic word concerning himself. So why would he say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, I set my course. You know, if you don't find an answer, just keep knocking until you get one. Yes. And so I just kept knocking. God, show me. Show me. And in my mind, you know, I'm not an English scholar. I don't know a lot of words. I left New Zealand when I was 10. So my English days stopped at the age of 10. And the rest of my life through school and through uh, to the, the early, um, late teens, actually through my teens, my language was Icelandic. So I don't, that's why it's easy for me to teach and easy for me people to understand it because I don't know any big words. <laughs> I don't have a big vocabulary. And, and uh, English is, is, it is my first language in the sense I was born in New Zealand, but the important years of my education were all done in Icelandic. And so, you know, it, it, sometimes things are a little foreign for me. So it's difficult sometimes to express and explain. And, and so I'm not an English scholar. I don't understand how the English language works. I know better how the Icelandic language works, and it's a lot more difficult than English. You've got, what, 26 letters in English, and they've got 34 in their language. Praise the Lord. So I'm, I'm sitting in my study, and I'm praying about this. No, 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 no. Glory. Knocking on the windows of heaven. Yes. God, talk to me. Yes. I, I need to understand. And all of a sudden, in my mind, came these words. Declarative question. Well, I've never heard that before. Have any of you ever heard that? No. A declarative question. A question that is not begging an answer, but is making a declaration. So I googled. Is there such a thing as a declarative question? Yes, there was. <laughs> to my shocking surprise, I've got some scholars coming up on my screen, 
explaining declarative questions. How about, say for example, I, I try to put it down in natural terms. Most of you here, you've, you've, you've had kids, well, probably everybody here has had kids, except for the kids. One day you'll have kids, the Lord willing. Uh, but have you ever grabbed your child when he's being naughty? I've done this. And grabbed him, took him by the ear or something, or sat him down and said, Why are you so naughty? Are you begging an answer? Or are you making a declaration? You're not, you're not, if they answered you, you'd put them over your knee. If they said to you, well, I'm so naughty because, and then they say, mom gave me too much sugar for breakfast, or, you know, and, and then they start to explain and ask you a question. You do not ask that question to be answered. You ask that question as a declaration, you are being naughty. Why are you being so naughty? Why are you naughty? It's not a question. It's a declaration. Yeah, yeah. Jesus did this many times in his earthly journey. I found multitudes of scriptures where Jesus asked declarative questions. Why? He asked the question, why tempt ye me? He's not begging answers. He's making statements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when Jesus was on the cross, and he said, Eli, Eli, oh. Lama, Shabbat Tani, glory be to God. He wasn't saying, now Father, I'm begging an answer from you. Why? Why have you turned your face away? He was not begging an answer. He was making a declaration that I am fulfilling the prophetic word. I was Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, 
Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I can understand where lama gets something confused here because that word uh, lama can, can also be uh, translated as purpose or reason for this purpose or for this reason. Praise God. And so it can be used in that way. And Shabbatani simply has to do with, be, with something being withdrawn or turning away. Praise God. So then it says, as some of them that stood by, when they heard that said, the man calleth for Elias, or Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on the reed and gave him to drink. Okay, now remember the order of what we just read. Now let's go to John chapter 19. I'll close here and let's see John's account of this because it adds a piece of the puzzle that's missing in Matthew. John chapter 19. Oh, thank you, Lord. That's what I say, too. John 19. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I bless you. Now remember what happened after Jesus said, Eli, Eli, Lama, Shabbatani. What did they do? They went and got vinegar, and that's a powerful study actually about that vinegar and what it was doing there and the hyssop that was used to praise God. Let's not talk about that. Oh, Jesus. Here in John 19, it says, beginning in verse 28, after this, oh, glory to God. Jesus knowing, listen now, here, here's a, a great missing piece. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. <laughs> that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And then they brought the sponge. In other words, if we put Matthew 27 and John 19 here together, what do we see? We see Eli, Eli, Lama Shabbatani. I thirst. For what was he thirsty? The presence. Ah! My soul that is 
withdrawn, as it were, from your presence, longs, thirsts for the living God. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Oh, what Jesus has done for me. Taking my, my sin, taking my double curse without and within, and suffering the most excruciating suffering for him of all. Any nation from the one he loved so much. Hallelujah. But Jesus said, you know what? I know my father loves me because I keep his commandments. He never doubted it. What he quoted there was not a doubt. It was a declaration. I know what I'm doing here. I know what's being fulfilled. I know this is what's going on. I'm fully aware that, oh my God, I thirst. I long for you. And that's the kind of thirst I want. Yes. This is the kind of thirst that David, the human, the mortal man, teaches us so much about through the Psalms. He thirsted and longed for God. 